if you get your Bible and go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's see, this one? This one. All right, I switched it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It's been a while since we've gone um, through um, with me on, on the 1 Corinthians passage. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, I've spoken a couple times with the first part on 1 Corinthians. Not sure if you were here for that, if you were awake for that, or if you remember it. Um, but we have spoken a few times uh, in the first part of First Corinthians. And so we'll kind of continue with um, this portion of First Corinthians and um, move forward. Well, let's pray as we look into God's word this afternoon. Father, we thank you for the, the privilege and the opportunity to open your word and to hear what you have for us. We want to be changed. We need you to speak to our hearts. Lord, we are in desperate need of you. And so I, I pray that we would see what you want us to learn from your word and that um, our hearts would be realigned and, and, and put in to place to match your heart and your desire for our own lives and for our church. Thank you so much for your patience with us and your, your dealing of kindness toward us as we um, so often have heard the truth and know the truth, but yet we're still lagging behind and we're still uh, not surrendering and not obeying in certain areas that we know we should. But I do thank you for your patience and thank you that you want to still take us as a church and conform us as individuals and really as a church to be in the image of your son and others would see you in Jesus name. Amen. So first Corinthians chapter three is where we're going to be going through today. And um, I know there are a few verses there. I know it's kind of got a lot in, in it, but um, hopefully we'll work our way through and hopefully you'll stay with me. You'll stay awake. The good thing with the uh, sandwiches for lunch is that they're not as heavy, right? We, if you guys were here back before the pandemic, we would have like a feast, which was delicious. Don't get me wrong, but whew, it could, your eyelids, your eyelids could fill it come the afternoon. And uh, if it wasn't freezing cold in here, right, it's nice and cozy and your eyes start to fill the the heaviness of that pasta or the heaviness of that that fried rice or whatever it was it just starts pulling those eyelids down so hopefully the sandwich your belly's still like i'm really hungry and you kind of stay awake right but if at some point you feel the urge to close the eyes try to keep one open all right <laughs> make me make me feel like you're halfway paying attention all right but I hope as we go through, it doesn't, uh, you don't kind of go off. And I know it's, it's, it's hard, right? You, you kind of know what you want to do this afternoon. And sometimes you're thinking about what's happening this afternoon. Um, maybe, maybe you don't get tomorrow off. So you're already thinking about what's going on tomorrow. Uh, maybe you do have tomorrow off. And so you're already thinking about what you have to do tomorrow. So <laughs> let's try to stay focused and, and let's listen to what the Lord has for us right now. OK, so we'll try to go this way. So I just want to go back to just the last uh, maybe seven verses of chapter two. I think that's important to understand. Chapter three and the context of what's being said. So it says in verse 10 of chapter two, but God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, 
save the spirit of man which is in him. And that makes sense, right? Now, we know some people in closer ways than others. We have, some of us, maybe a spouse who knows us sometimes better than ourselves, right? My wife can know what I'm thinking sometimes before I share it or whatever. Sometimes she may know what I'm going to think before I'm realizing I'm going to think it. She knows me well enough, right? That's normally the wife is really good at that. Sometimes, guys, we get in trouble because we haven't thought about (laughs) what she was going to say or do or feel or whatever. Then we're in trouble, right? So we're not as into that as we should be. But sometimes we know how somebody else feels or thinks or something to that effect, right? But no one really knows everything that's going on inside my mind unless i'm expressing to someone but i might not express everything to you but you can only know what i've told you i'm thinking or feeling or have inside that's you can only know by what i tell you but who really knows i know what's going on in there i know my sinful thoughts i know the other thoughts I know what's happening inside. And so who really knows what's going on inside a person? The person, the spirit of that person. So who really knows God? Who really knows what God is thinking? Who really knows what what God is doing? The spirit of God. He is the one who is fully aware of the way God thinks. He's God, right? So he totally understands that. So that's kind of taking it from human standpoint to a spiritual standpoint. The spirit of God really knows what God thinks. So it keeps going. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God really knows the way God thinks. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. We have received the Spirit of God, therefore we can know what God thinks. We can know who God is. We can know how He feels. The Spirit of God reveals that to us because He knows and He is aware. So therefore we're able to see and to understand spiritual truths. Not because we're just amazing people and we figured it out. It's not something that we can earn a degree in, in the sense of like, I've read enough, I've accomplished enough, I have now figured out God. No, the Spirit of God is the one who reveals these truths to us so we can see them, so we can understand them, so we can grasp them. Does that make sense? Yeah? So it's not us. It's the Spirit of God. So who has known the mind of the Lord, verse 16, that he may instruct him? Who really knows that? But guess what, guys? Guess what, church of Corinth? Guess what, church of of, of Sheepshead Bay? You have the mind of Christ. Wow. Who understands and who knows the way God thinks? The Spirit of God. Well, guess what? The Spirit of God is in you. And the Spirit of God teaches you. The Spirit of God makes things clear. So you are in tune with the way God thinks because it's His Spirit who's teaching you and revealing those things to you. Wow. That's deep. Right? On a human level, you don't know the what I'm thinking unless I'm telling you this is the way I'm thinking about something. This is how I feel about something. On a spiritual level, he is the one who is telling us and teaching us and revealing himself to us and making us understand. It's the Spirit of God that does this work. So, Paul then, after finishing and explaining that, says in chapter 3, And I, brethren, I could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babies or babes in Christ. 
Paul says, I wanted to speak to you in deeper ways, in more spiritual truths of understanding, but I couldn't because you're carnal. And I had to deal with you like a baby. Now, Paul in this chapter gives us three different metaphors to take spiritual truths and to put them in everyday living um, application for us to, to understand, right? Because, you know, some of us are a little simple minded and we need to see it. We need to understand. it. So here is a good uh, metaphor involving babies. Now, whether you've had a bunch of babies or one or been near one or know of how humans work in general, when a baby is born, you don't bring the baby home and say, we're so glad you made it. We've thrown you a feast. Have at it, right? I've got prime rib for you. I've got, I don't know what you guys love the most, but I've got it <laughs> thrown out here on the table, baby. We are so glad you're home. Eat, baby, eat. You're like, duh, right? <laughs> you feed the baby milk. And then after a few months... You throw in the cereal, right? You throw in the cereal. I'm not talking about Cinnamon Toast Crunch. It's not what I'm talking about. That comes in a couple years. And then they won't eat the regular cereal like oatmeal and rice and those things. But that's when you start throwing in the grains, right? You throw in cereal. You throw in rice. And different people have different methods, all right? I understand. But some people say, well, then you start with vegetables, because if you start with fruit, then they only like the sweet stuff. So you got to start with the green beans and this and that. And then you throw in the fruits and then and then some people eat the jar baby food. Other people use the, the food that's on the table, but then they blend it up. Right. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But all of us have the same idea and understanding. You start with milk. You start with pureed foods after that. And then eventually they start to chew on things. And nowadays we have like the cheese doodles, right? They bite it and it's solid, but then it disintegrates in their mouth, right? Things like that. It goes away. And you, you develop and they grow older and they learn how to chew. They learn how to swallow. They get teeth. Then you give them meat and then they, they really like it and they enjoy it. And then when they become a teenager, perhaps all they do is eat meat. And you're like, that's enough. Eat some vegetables. I don't have enough money. Right? So there are things that we notice as humans. They start out and then they mature and they can handle other things. But he said, you know what? I had to deal with you as spiritual babies. You couldn't handle the meat. And that's, that's a place where we all start off as babies. But unfortunately, sometimes we stay eating like a baby. Can you imagine, you know, 15-year-old coming in and he's going through lunch and he says, uh, did you have any baby food? Right? <laughs> Do you guys have any baby food back there? I know I have teeth, but I would like baby food. Right? Can you imagine? A grown adult saying, I don't know how to chew food. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get choked on it. I've never had that before. That's ridiculous. Like, why would you even talk about that? Why would you even say that? That's dumb. But yet there are people who have been God's child for years. And when it comes to spiritual matters, they still eat and live like a baby. Well, how is, how is someone matured? How is someone growing? How is someone developing from just a spiritual baby who, who's been sitting in the pew for 15 years to a person who is spiritually mature and able to handle things? It comes by someone spending that time with the Lord and trying to see and understand what does God want for me? Who is God? And it's allowing that person, what we saw in chapter two, allowing God to work in us and to reveal truths to us. It's not, I want to make it clear, it's not just 
gathering a bunch of Bible facts. A kid can go to a Christian school or to homeschool, and they can have Bible class growing up as kids and get filled with Bible facts. That does not make someone with a bunch of Bible facts spiritually mature. It's understanding God's word and then being able to apply it in life. Being able to use God's word to discern God's heart, God's plan, God's will, God's desires. There is now discernment being applied in their life. And that is the growth of spiritual maturity. Some of us can't handle some of the things from God's word because it's we don't know enough about God. Then we begin to argue, oh, well, it means this or that, and we're missing other parts of Scripture. Maybe we don't know. And this is where we were talking, we heard this morning, when we're interacting with someone, we have to be meek in our response, meek in our training, humble before them, because... We haven't, we haven't figured this out on our own by some, earning some doctorate degree in Bible factology, right? It is by getting to know our God. It's, it's what we've heard from him and learned of him, and it's by the work that he's done in us. And so we need to see and understand Paul is confronting them and saying, look, I had to treat you like spiritual babies. I had to feed you milk. And the reason was because... You were fleshly. You were carnal. That was hindering their growth was the fact that they were living worldly, fleshly lives. Paul, come on. Why are you saying that we're worldly? Why would you say that? Okay, well, I'll tell you why. He says in verse 2, or verse 3, For you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you, here's, here's how I know you're carnal, you're fleshly, you're not spiritual. Because there's envying, there's strife, there's divisions. Because that's existing in your church, in your fellowship, in your community, that's proof that you're worldly. That's proof that you're living fleshly because that's the fruit that's being ex exhibited from your congregation. There's envy among you. There's some feelings like uh, of, of uh, jealousy or um, of, of maybe anger toward other people. And now it's starting to get strife where you're saying things against one another. And then, you know, now it gets even more. There's divisions. Now, not only have you said certain things, now you've kind of, Made your own little groups. Isn't that what human nature does? You're acting like the men of the world. So that's why I'm saying you're fleshly. Oh, yeah? Well, what proof do you have that there's envy, strife, and division in our church? Right? Have you ever heard little children fight? No way. Yeah, you know, I tell you, friend. <laughs> have, have you ever heard little children fight? If not, I you know, just work in the nursery probably one Sunday. I'm sure my son will be fighting Asher over something, right? Whether Asher did anything or not, I'm sure Ezra's going to be like, oh, how dare you, Asher? Asher's like, what did I do? I didn't do anything. But Ezra's going to do that. Why? Because he's my son. Right. He's like his dad. He's going to he's going to sin. He's going to fight for some unknown reason. But little kids fight over over dumb things. Right. What's happening? What? Why? Why are you guys fighting? Well, uh, he he then and I had the pillow first. For what? I told you to fold laundry. Why do you need a pillow to fold laundry? When you're, you're fighting over a pillow when we're supposed to be doing... Why? That doesn't even make sense. And now you're making your, your, your sibling cry over this. Like, what's the point? Right? If we laugh. 
Have you ever heard adults fight over dumb stuff? <laughs> it's dumb stuff. It's almost like it's worse when adults fight because they should know better. It's like for a kid, it's like, well, they're a kid, you know. Adults fight over dumb stuff. It's ridiculous. And so Paul says, look, you guys are fleshly. Well, why do you say that? Well, there's envy, strife, and division. Well, why would you say that? And he says, here's how I can say that. Because some of you are sitting around saying, well, I'm from Paul's clan. And some of you are saying, well, I'm from Apollos' clan. Because of that, there's proof that there's division, which is proof that you guys are living worldly and carnal. They should have just listened and been like, oh, yeah, we are carnal. And now he had to go into specifics, right? And give them proof. It's crazy. Paul had been in Corinth first. All right, fine. Later, uh, I believe Paul was in Ephesus. And then I, I, I hope I have the, the right city. Um, and then Apollos was there. And then he got trained. And then he wanted to go back over to, uh, or he wanted to go over to Achaia, to, to, to Corinth area. And so then he went over there later. So now you have this group of people where they're saying, well, we're from when? We're, we're following Paul. And others are saying, we're following Apollos. Paul's like, that's that's crazy. You're fighting over dumb things. Let me tell you about Paul and Apollos. Paul says, let me explain who Paul and Apollos are to you guys, because you must be missing something. And he moves to the next metaphor for us to see. And he takes us to farming, which all of us are so familiar with. I'm sure. Right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. He moves us to the next metaphor of farming. Now, I did grow up in the country. I did not grow up on a farm. I didn't. All right. I have very limited um, gardening skills. Uh, my brother says of my dad, he could lick a stick, put it in the ground, and it's going to grow. I don't know. He's got some sort of powers. I don't know what he has. Me? Man, tomatoes, which are like supposed to be really easy, still don't always do very well when I'm involved, right? But I think all of us are pretty familiar with the, 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 the process of a plant, right? Even if we don't garden or even if we don't try to plant a flower in our house or something like that. But it's pretty, pretty simple. Seed goes in the ground cover it, needs sunlight, needs some water, and then sometimes things start to grow out. And then, you know, every now and then we put some water on it and it grows bigger. And then if it's like, let's say a tomato plant, because that's a good illustration, it gets the little yellow, the blooms on it, and you're like, this is a good sign. I'm excited. And then it goes away and what happens? The tomato starts growing. And it starts producing. What have we done to get to this process? We put a seed in the ground and we put water on it. We can help it. We can we can go to Home Depot. We get the miracle Grow. We pour that mess on there because we're wanting some, a lot of tomatoes. And they say that that makes it grow mir miraculously. So we're going to put it on there, right? Maybe we put some fencing around it to keep the squirrels from digging in it or taking our tomatoes, right? There's something that we're trying to do. But at what point did you give that seed life? You didn't. Good, good answer. At what point did you give growthingness to that plant? You never did. At what point did you help that fruit come out of the buds and just become the most fruitful vine out of all of your three tomato plants. Who did that? You didn't. What happened? You put the seed in there and you poured water on it. The rest, thankfully, God is in control and he made that plant grow. And so Paul is now taking them to farming, which they should understand how plants work. And he says, look, we're just servants. This is what we did. I was involved in the planting process. 
Apollos, he came over and guess what he did? He poured the water on you guys. But it wasn't us who did any life imparting into your soul. It wasn't either of us that did the fruitfulness from your lives. You know who did that? That was God. God is the one who gave life. God is the one who caused fruitfulness. Therefore, glory in God, not in us. We're just mere servants. That's all we are. We are simply servants <laughs> that God has allowed us to participate in his ministry. That's all we are. And you guys are fighting over which team you're on. You guys are divided about, oh, I'm on Paul's team and I'm on Apollos' team. This is, this is not right. We are all on God's team. Guys, we're all on the same team. Whether you like your teammates or not. You know what the command is? Love your teammates because we're all on the same team. I, I enjoy watching hockey. I enjoy it. And it's a, it's a team sport. There are certain there are certain players who may get a lot of the, the accolades, a lot of the attention. But if that is if if that's the only person out there on the ice against the whole other team, you know what's gonna happen? He's always gonna lose. Even the team with the greatest player, he's nothing without the team. It is a team sport. It involves everyone's participation. You can have an all-star goalie, you know, blocking those pucks like crazy, right? But if he doesn't have defensive people in front of him, he can't stop 500 pucks. He can't do it. It's not possible. But if he has a good defense, he can stop the 30 that get past the defense. But if he has a good offense, at least his team has points, right? That's important. It's a team sport. And we are all part of the same team, working together for the same goal. And what is that goal? To glorify God. And Paul and Apollos were not the ones to get the glory, but they were just there to point the team to the Lord, that he gets the glory. So he's saying, don't glory in us. Don't put us first. Don't exalt us. It was God that gave the increase. Verse number nine, as he's finishing up that metaphor with the, the farming, we are laborers together with God, for we are God's husbandry, and you are God's building. And here is the source of the empowerment that Paul as a servant was, was empowered by God. What, what is the source? It says in verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I even want to make sure you guys understand something. I came to you as a servant and all of the stuff that happened, all of the things that you heard me speak, all of the things that transpired while I was there, all of that was because of God's grace in my life. It wasn't because I'm something special. It's because of him being special. He empowered me. He is the one who led me there. He is the one who told me what to speak and let me be involved. He is the one who filled me with love to deal with you spiritually immature believers and to be patient with you and to be forbearing with you. This was a place where Paul had spent quite a bit of time. It wasn't one of those uh, quick trips, three weeks, and moved on. He spent a amount of time with these people. He's fully aware of who they are, what they act like, and he remembers this. And he's heard other reports back and forth about what's going on in that city. And so... Here he is. He's letting them know all of that happened because of God's grace on my life. And he uses another metaphor for building. Now, I don't I don't know 
all of you that, well, I don't know how many of you are good with handy work. Um, that is not my area of expertise. It's not. I did a couple I did a couple of summers in construction, and I remember the second summer I was like, I'm really glad I'm done with this. I will never do this. I just, it doesn't work. It doesn't work in my brain. It, normally, whatever I've finished working on probably doesn't work either. It's just not, I, I really have a hard time with handy work stuff. It, it doesn't. It doesn't work. And there are times where I have to do stuff at my house and I'll have to pray. And I know that might seem like craziness to you, but over over little things of being repaired or fixed. Oh, God, I need your help trying to fix the flapper in the toilet or whatever. It is. Like it's like I understand it's it's I'm just not it doesn't work for me in my brain. But here he is. He's going to use a building analogy. He said, I laid a foundation. When I was there, I taught and I laid the foundation. According to the grace that God gave me, I did it. And what was the foundation that was laid? Jesus. This is what I taught. This is what I preached. Jesus. That's the foundation that I laid. The foundation is not something you see when you're looking at the outside of the house right you dig down in the ground deep at least foundation i've worked on dig it around and it's like a trench and then they're going to come in and they're going to fill that trench for the house full of concrete makes a nice sturdy foundation and then what do they do they begin to build off of that nice solid, flat foundation. They'll build up from that. Typically, they'll use cinder blocks on top of that foundation. And then after the cinder blocks, then they'll start putting the wood around it, right? It's vital that that foundation is strong and sturdy. If you just throw like four posts in the ground and like, let's give it a go, that's a deck. It's not really a house, right? You need something that's got a strong foundation that's really going to last. If you're ever looking for a house, what's one thing somebody looks for in the house? Go down and look at that foundation. If they have a basement you can get into to see the foundation. You go down in the basement and you look at the foundation. If there's a big crack, that's when you say, oh, your house is pretty. I'm going to look for another one, right? You don't want a house with a faulty foundation. You want a house that's going to last. You might have to repair the siding. You might have to fix the roof. But the house is sturdy and strong because the foundation is there. What's the foundation? Jesus is the foundation. That's strong. That's sturdy. That's not going to fall. You stay on the foundation of Jesus, you're not going to fall. Now, Apollos has come in. Other teachers have come in. Others are now teaching and leading and speaking and directing, right? And Paul is saying in verse number 11, right? He says, the foundation can no man lay than that is laid. That's Jesus. Now, if any man builds upon this foundation, he can build with gold. He can build with silver. He can build with precious stones. He can throw on some wood. He can throw on some hay. He can throw on with stubble. Any other servants of God that are coming in and they're, they're building on top of the foundation of Jesus. What does it say? Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day, the day of judgment shall declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he's built thereon, he shall receive a reward. But if any man's work shall be burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, shall be delivered, yet so as by fire. So now he's, he's clarified, look, we are really 
just mere servants. But I want to point out, mere servants, all of us, guess what? We build upon the foundation of Jesus through our teaching, through our serving, through our ministries, through being involved according to the grace that God has given us, right? And we build upon that foundation out of different materials, gold, silver, precious stones, and then wood, hay, stubble. And as God looks and judges, some things will stand, some things will last, but other things will be burnt up. They won't last. And that day of judgment will reveal what was lasting and help build upon the foundation of Jesus and those things that didn't help build up the church. Hey, let's understand we're all mere servants. There's not one who's better than another. We are all simply servants of God. But God will judge each one of us according to what has happened through our lives. Now, in our serving, in our living, in the way that we allowed God to use us, have we been used in a way to help build our church in a way that's going to last? Or have we kind of said things maybe that aren't God's word? Have we been involved in teaching things that weren't really true or right? Did we give advice that wasn't godly advice? Did we serve in a manner that was faithless? Did we do something and say, God, I'm going to go do this. I came up with a plan. Now I want you to bless it. See how there's a difference? But if it's something where God says, I want you to do this, and I'm going to empower you to do it. I want you to speak this truth. And then it builds upon the church, upon the foundation of Jesus, and the church grows. Hey, church, Sheep said Bay, we're just mere servants. But as mere servants, remember we will be judged. We will be tried to see if what we did really will last. If it will stand or will it all just vanquish and disappear? Whatever's done for the Lord, that's going to last. Whatever's done by the Lord, whatever is empowered by the Lord, those things matter. Those things count. It's vital that we be used by God as servants but to build upon the right foundation. In verse 16 and 17, Know you not that ye are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple ye are? Does that sound familiar to any other passage of Scripture about you being the temple of God? Does that sound familiar? Anybody else know any other verse that might be like, hmm, you're in the temple of the Holy Spirit? Oh, chapter 6. That's true. Chapter 6. If you just turn, uh, it depends on your Bible, one or two, three pages over. Chapter 6, verse 18, it says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man does is without the body. But he that commits fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Wow. That sounds familiar. You guys have heard this verse? Yes. Right? So here in chapter 6, He's talking about your individual body. Don't you know that you, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? 
Now, chapter three is different. Chapter three, the you is plural. You all are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You, church, you're the temple of God. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you, body of believers? And if any man's going to come and defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. God loves his church. God's going to protect his church. God wants to keep his church holy. We need to understand that the Spirit of God dwells among our body as believers. Yes, He dwells us internally. Yes. But here's the family of God as we're gathered together. This is important. And so Paul has tried to explain to these babies, these spiritual babies, I wanted to give you guys so much more, but you couldn't take it. Because you're living fleshly lives. You're living carnal lives. You've started to fight over the fact that we're just merely servants. And now you're starting to pick teams. We're all on the same team. We're all in it together. And then he's reminding us, hey, you're mere servants too. Act like it and remember that God wants to use you to build upon the foundation and one day he's going to judge you. And you want to come through with things being visible and lasting. Not for the glory of you. That's not who gets the glory. When you do things for your own glory, guess what? That's wood, hay, stubble. But when things are done to glorify God, that's what counts. Because he's seen. And it's so that the church will be built up and established. And then he just, I know it's in the next chapter, but the first verse says, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of God and stewards of the ministries of God. I know these chapter divisions weren't there when Paul wrote it, okay? He didn't, he didn't finish and say, okay, chapter four, right? He didn't do it. He wrote a letter. So it, you kind of carry over that next verse. He even, he even says there in the first verse, just remember and Count us, reconcile us as just ministers. We're, we're just mere servants. That's all we are. So let us not fight. Let us not bicker and pick teams because we're on God's team. But let's all be involved as mere servants seeking to build up our church with gold, silver, precious stones, something that will last and stand true, right?